I am um, delighted to be here and I want to welcome you all. And it's a pleasure to speak to an audience of such size. You are actually connected to Hopkins and to a faculty here who uh, hopes to share with you some of the discoveries she's made in her research and in her teaching career um, that have to do with her appreciation of Jane Austen extraordinary, Jane Austen's extraordinary novelistic talent. Um, and what I hope to offer you is a, a richer context for your experience of our two central texts, namely Emma and Persuasion, as well, with a special emphasis already today, as well as various aspects of a portrait of Jane Austen as a woman, as a woman artist, and as a writer. Now, it might be a good idea to give you a few uh, uh, tips about my methodology. My students all know that. Um, I work um, in a spiral in all of my teaching. Um, I start um, with a theme, a notion, an idea that might appear on the face of it quite difficult. But if it is difficult, I do make sure to come back to it. Um, regularly. In other words, I might be setting up questions today that are beyond the range of what I can teach you, but you can trust me and your questions will help me as well, that I can always come back and explain further. And certain things will be explained in the progression of the lecture because one of the important things about our project here is that I have looked at four presentations and that these four presentations somehow hang, to, hang together and that uh, they have um, at the end point of our journey uh, what seems very meaningful to me now especially which is to see in Austin someone who is um, profoundly interested in fact in questions that have to do with itself with the other and the others in the plural and as well as human relations. And uh, I, I believe in those human relations. I believe in those active communications. And that's why I'm teaching. And I hope to persuade you to some degree that uh, there is a different Jane Austen waiting for you in the wings, which I'm going to gradually, I can't pull her from a hat, but I'm gradually going to bring her to the front, which is part of what I want to do today. Uh, now, I am not a high wire artist. <laughs> in other words, I am risk adverse, and you might see every now and again something like this ha happen, which is just a sign that I am actually using a script and my notes. And, uh, uh, you know, think of it like uh, having a cat or a dog next to you that you use for comfort. Mm -hmm. This is my own little prop, but um, I hope that with without too many technical challenges, I'll be able to use, that seems useful to state right away, to use the slides as a kind of resting place for the eyes and also sometimes differently as a kind of thinking place where we can begin to unpack some of the questions that um, are of interest to us. And um, I will say that my talk is in two parts, that it focuses first on images and bodies, and then in a second part, and that will give the impetus to more work afterwards, it focuses on language works, words, language words and talk. Now, I do want to say also that for today, for this first lecture, um, I, I want to dedicate it to my very much uh, missed teacher, George Steiner, who passed away, age 90, in Cambridge on February 3rd. Fortunately, not from COVID-19, but fortunately also, he didn't know about the pandemic. But someone, as you can hear, who has had a tremendous influence on my teaching career and who is going to be one of the partners I engage with in the conversation that I'm having with him about what he wrote in some of his major pieces, especially a piece in the volume called On Difficulty. So without further ado now, I am going to start by my standard introduction, which basically has to tell you why read Jane Austen now. 
um, after all, especially with the picture that you have there on the screen, she seems to be a very insular presence in the literary and cultural landscape. And uh, at the present moment, the divide can seem even more immense. Uh, on her side, hmm, she never crossed the British Channel. She never explored the inspiringly romantic Lake District, and she only made a few occasional trips into fashionable London. She couldn't afford it uh, for quite a stretch of her life. So, you know, Austin, quintessentially British now, and then Austin, of course, presented to you by somebody who clearly has some kind of an accent as well, not British, not purely British. And, uh, you know, maybe, um, there is something wrong-headed here about the project because uh, we're in a moment where what's being drummed into us are the words of global, pan, huh? everywhere, it's everywhere, and the pandemic. And there's something a little odd about going local, but we will go local because um, that will be helpful. The other thing to mention maybe is that we might be reading Jane Austen right now because we actually for once have time on our hands, maybe too much time in these extraordinary times. Um, but I'm hoping <laughs> that it's not only just to fill a void that um, you're thinking of reading Austin with me, it's also because uh, I think you're going to find that by rereading her or reading her for the first time with me, you're going to learn something that uh, I have found crucial in my reading career. Namely, you're going to learn to imagine to dream, to remember, and you're going to learn to enter into other people's worlds. And that's very important. How do you get into the minds and the worlds of other people? That's a question we ask ourselves when we study fiction. So let me make my pitch in a way. Uh, my pitch is what's behind me. I don't, I think you can see some of them. My pitch is to say, I deal in books. That's my world. And what I want to assume is that uh, pulled from a shelf, carried in one's pocket, on a satchel, in a pocket, book, books have this amazing capacity to communicate ideas across time. And um, in a way, I'll take one of them especially out here, and I'll show it to you, I'll wave it out for you here, Pride and Prejudice. And I think everybody will agree uh, that if you look at a crafted work, which is maybe more familiar to you, which is Pride and Prejudice, what you're going to find is that that work is really a work of extremely wonderful craft of an enlightened, highly skilled author whose fiction can do much more than just entertain us. It can hold up a mirror to the world. It can help us reflect on who we are, on where we are, important after all, and how to behave. And um, it might even guide us in some interesting ways in terms of actions that we might be taking, of acts, gestures that uh, we're thinking about in those most uncertain of springs in, in 2020. Now, at the center of this world uh -huh, are these books uh, and a peculiar and interesting challenge, namely the following. The following is that, after all, there's no need to even advertise uh, uh, Jane Austen these days. Why would, would there be a need? Because there are so many adaptations and appropriations of Austen. And um, what I'm going to try and do quickly, because I really don't want this to be the focus of my introduction, though it's something we can discuss in question time, is just to remind you of the ways in which adaptations and appropriations of Austin's work have in fact peopled our imagination with ways in which we've been perceiving and reading Jane Austen. Uh, there is a kind of BBC Hollywood Anglo-American multimedia Jane Austen uh, that has really, I think for many of us, seeped in our consciousness. And I have seen it most, by the way, when I've been teaching some of my younger students in some of my less, least advanced classes. Um, and what that means um, 
is that we are actually looking at a celebrity figure, somebody who is a fashion item, and uh, something maybe that some of you are aware, as in a way, <laughs> you wouldn't be here if she wasn't a fashion item still. Huh? So what am I talking about, in fact? I'm talking about a, the kind of memorabilia that have been sold at tremendously high prices in various auctions recently. In fact, um, often it's been, it's been a competition between um, official institutions like libraries and universities and private collectors to actually keep one's hand on a precious sample of an autograph by Jane Austen or uh, a piece of manuscript. But let me show you another one here. This one um, is the kind of thing that uh, my undergrad students have been totally sensitive to. Here is Kelly Clarkson, hmm, a singer and songwriter who actually started her career in um, American Idol. And uh, from what I learned about two, three years ago, she was able to buy a ring that we think actually belonged to the very person of Jane Austen. And, you know, as an other example, uh, from the costume department here, huh, there has been an amazing market, so to speak, in terms of um, objects, but also in terms of costume, in terms of style and fashion even. Um, that coincides in a way with the kind of work that my colleague Leo Proetti is doing in his course on fashion, that uh, the fashion styles that were rather elegant of the Jane Austen world, uh, not only feel quaint for some, but actually have become some interesting fashion items that are visible um, in different places. However, for the scholar that I am, actually, there are things that are more interesting to examine. And here is one uh, example that I want to share with you because uh, it gives you a really interesting insight in the kind of ideas and the kinds of um, context of um, cultural transformation and transport that occurs when uh, Jane Austen begins to be translated. Look at this, 1828, a translation, and no need to know any French here, but a translation of Sense and Sensibility. Very early on, the first novel to really hit the road, so to speak. And with Sense and Sensibility, what you have is an amazing uh, insight, in fact, in the kind of history of reception of Austin's book, not only in England, but across the channel. The book has already crossed the channel. And um, you'll see, uh, raison et sensibilité, which means reason and huh, sensibility, feeling. Uh, maybe even sentiment. Words don't overlap between the two languages, but it's as good an attempt as any to actually produce a good title. Um, so that's, you know, one way of reading this, uh, this title page. But if you look at the bottom also, let me just try and help you there, what you find is that it was actually published by a librarian, as they used to be called, but now we call them publishers, whose specialty was in fact what you call world literature or in fact travel literature. In other words, here is an attempt to market a new book by Jane Austen about a big world, a big world of travel, a world that's almost exotic in fact, uh, as if uh, you needed to uh, make a pitch here for somebody who really is divided from your um, uh, French sensibility by quite a big gap. And uh, I, you know, I, I look at this and I, I, I think about something else as well. I think about what this book cover, I don't own the book in this case, it's actually in a library in France. What this book cover does, among other things, is to bring to the fore um, what it meant in the early years of the 19th century, when people found that books were actually still very expensive, there were no paperbacks, what it meant to actually buy a book like this and how you were 
if possible, going to try and sell that book to somebody. Well, one way of, of selling it is obviously, we're in a moment of restoration, is to trump up a title. So if you notice in the middle of the page, huh, the book is by a certain Madame La Baronne Isabelle de Montlieu. It sounds very good in French, doesn't it? It says something about, about a world where a woman uh, who carries a title, who maybe is in need of money after the French Revolution, right? We've had the French Revolution in France. She's in need of money and she's found an occupation as a woman that might be rather um, lucrative. She has decided not to translate the novel, but actually to rewrite it. She has a new script for it. Traduit librement de l'anglais means uh, translated very freely. In other words, adapted from the English. And I think her most brilliant pitch for the book is the subtitle. So we have reason and sentiment or sensibility, or big or here, two ways of loving. Wow, you're getting a book that actually teaches you two ways of loving, huh? Um, well, I wonder what these ways of loving are, huh? But uh, one thing is sure, uh, there is a certain expectation that um, what these two ways of loving would be showing you hmm, is something like this, perhaps, right? Um, and I, you know, I, I show you here one of the prized items in my book collection. Uh, the book is actually here. Hmm? The little book is here. Um, but I, I'm just not telling you more about the book. I'm just showing you two pictures that, for me, are a very good caption of the kind of um, scope that this title might suggest to the casual reader who um, reading about publicity in a magazine or hearing through friends in, in Paris or in some other French town about this new production, namely Raison et Sentiment, Two Ways of Loving, that person might actually buy the book just because uh, here are some women on one side, um, a group of women, um, they look at each other, they look at themselves, and what do they see? Well, maybe if you read my book, you're going to find yourself at the other end, happily married. And you notice how nicely staged this is. And um, even though uh, this is actually from Pride and Prejudice, you notice that you again have a pairing of two couples, as if there was a kind of constant kind of pattern in the imagination of, uh, of our author. Be it as it may, uh, be it as it may, you're looking here at the image of a, of a contrast uh, between uh, two ways of um, looking at the novel. And I told you film can't be dispensed with. Here is one very lively and I think very evocative capture of two women not looking at each other, yet being, being in a kind of parallel situation. And, um, I won't say much because um, time is running fast, especially if I have uh, challenges with my PowerPoint, but I will mention, and we can talk about that in question time if you like, that one of the things that of course one could bear in mind here is that the inspiration for that partnership of two women and for this novel may have come from none other than the relationship between Jane Austen and the sister whom she affectionately called Cass, uh, the sister that she called the son of my life, the gilder of every pleasure, and the sister, in fact, with whom she, she said she, uh, she shared a room um, from her early years of adulthood, actually. But we need to push this a little further. Huh? Two ways of loving and maybe nothing shows you and invites you more to think about these two ways of loving than to actually look on one side at the illustration. There are not many, actually. The book is expensive, but there are not many illustrations. But this is one of the very catching, fetching illustrations in the book that we've been talking about, the translation by Madame La Baronne. And note that um, in her adaptation, uh, she writes uh, liberally or freely, she writes, um, he picked her up in her arms 
without her being able to defend herself. She picked her up in her arms without her being able to defend herself, which you can tell has connotation of maybe a little bit of a rapture or even something more insistent, but she can't resist, that's clear, the charm hmm, of the figure who is picking her up here and carrying her um, gently in her arms. And in fact, the power of this image is such that you have it on that other side of the slide in a film directed by Ang Lee. One of the amazing things is the best films on Jane Austen are actually very well researched. So here you have an example. Now, um, we, we, we have traveled, we've moved, uh, we've understood that uh, one of the things that films can do is actually to make a character in a novel more popular, but we also understand that the film somehow enriches uh, what we understand to be the presence of the body in uh, the novels of Jane Austen. And uh, one of the reasons why I, I slow down on this, and there are going to be other stops like this, is because one of my themes for today has to do with the idea of talking about the body uh, as evoked in words and not in images. And I begin with images because it's easier. It's easier to actually make you see huh, what happens when uh, Jane Austen writes words that are ready for romantic or erotic appropriation, as they were by the translator, who took them very literally in some ways. And uh, what it means to actually read Austen with a kind of attention or attentiveness to the ways in which she stages the body in her work. Um, others have done that kind of research, have helped me see this, but um, you'll see how important it is. Now, here are some of these bodies actually, aren't they, that we associate with Jane Austen. The film on one side and the portrait on the other, but those are the, the bodies not only of women that are being carried away, but of young men that are part of the whole charm, <laughs> offensive, so to speak, uh, that is, is legible in the fiction of Austen. But Austen's world is so different. Uh, I'm quoting here from uh, a description, Chawton village, a dozy place, startled into attention several times a day by the clatter or rapid coach traffic through its center, stood where three roads met. Hmm? That's the place where Jane Austen was anchored. That is her world. And it is amazing to think what it means or could have meant to live in that small corner of England uh, that has prompted millions of on-screen visits and, and to think about the convergence of money, of talent that has been nourished by this long industry of revisitations of the place, um, in sight, on sight. Thank you, <laughs> I see the French flag there. Uh, and and uh, as we see that, what, would, what do we draw by way of a conclusion from that, well, what we recognize, which is an important item in the things I want to teach to you today, what we recognize is that there is something in the tapestry of characters that Jane Austen's novels produce that, they, that, that is distinctive, that the drama, the emotions, the specificity of the descriptions in which these characters are set may well belong to a distinctive universe, but they persuade us somehow huh, that the world of Jane Austen is actually alive. You see my enthusiasm here, but I'm enthusiastic at the thought that something as small and as confined and as restricted actually produces the opportunity to reach out to another world. And the reaching out to, the, to another world, I will emphasize again, is not one that with Austin happened this film. It happened with that simple, rather now cheap, but at her time expensive item, the book. Now, one of the 
next items I would like to bring up with you is the ways in which Jane Austen fits into a culture that has to do with educating, enriching, in fact, the elements of a culture. And let me go a little more slowly here. That's something I learned from my teacher, George Steiner, actually. Sometimes one has to go slow. So one of the things that uh, we need documentation for has to do with the ways in which we can come closer to issues that reach deep into the cultural assumptions we make about the way we, as humans, grow up and yet are always held back by moments of useful infatuations that we remember as being part of how we think we grow up. Uh, there is in the way in which Jane Austen writes, a capacity to bring us back. It's not regression. It's much more interesting than that. It's not nostalgia or pure nostalgia. It's this ability to spark the flame. My students call it, my undergrads, infatuation. To spark the flame of what it was like to be young and to be in love. And uh, in fact, <laughs> what's paradoxical, I like paradoxical. Uh, par par paradoxes in my thinking. What's paradoxical is that nothing maybe helps me make a better demonstration for that than to actually share with you my trunk card for today, which is my little book here, which uh, I'm waving out here in front of the screen. Can you see it? It says Cozy Classics, Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. In the back, it says that it is a uh, marketed, I read it like that, as a classic to be given to a child in the very friendly format, of course, of a hard book, hard back book, but I, you know, one of those uh, children's book uh, with, you know, serious boards of uh, paper in there that enable you to share with your child um, well-loved stories with child-friendly words and 12 needle-felted illustrations. And I may, you know, here it is, the back. I may sound a little ironic here, and actually I'm, I'm not really ironic. I think this is an amazing project. The idea that you are all going to use a book like this, and Jane Austen after all, to bring a child into a vocabulary as well as into an imagery that goes back to that moment of romance that is so powerful in Jane Austen, uh, that idea has its own attractions. And I have to say, I'm full of admiration for the people who did the felt figures, though I think at times they look a little too quaint or that they don't, they don't smile enough, but it must be hard to do. But these felt figures huh, will be following me and us in across a few of the lectures because, frankly, I look at them as interesting anchoring points for what might be, in fact, the important, the central themes of what we need to know and understand and actually think about differently in terms of Jane Austen. What they do, certainly, uh, is that these books actually help us see what it meant, or what it can mean still nowadays, to think about the big old question, what is love? Hmm? What is love? Well, what is love for the producers of, the, uh, of this book, and I call them producers because it was a team effort and because uh, they all got together and reread the book, I imagine, and decided that they could only afford about 12 pictures. I think there are about 12. And in those 12 pictures, you have the, the sum total, so to speak, of what you need to know about, about well, that 
big plot stories, you already know how it starts. It starts with women and it ends with them being at the other end, uh, greeted in that beautiful white wedding that we see, in fact, even though not all weddings were like that in Austin's days, in that setting that you've already seen in my first slide from the book. Um, you could almost you know, push that a little further and say we could use this like anthropologists in a way and, and say that in a culture of a certain class, of a certain world, of certain countries, and with all due degrees of differentials, but in a European culture and probably in an American culture as well, uh, the kind of narratives that you have in Jane Austen, and they're in Emma and they're in Persuasion, but in very different ways, but they're certainly in Pride and Prejudice, these kinds of narratives have in fact gained the status of a myth. Scholars tell us, in fact, that myths are invented by cultures because they help us make sense of contradictions. They help us structure the contradictions or the paradoxes of the romance that we're going to be talking about. Now, this in a way, I could say, is the end of my introduction. Uh, it is the end of my introduction, but I want to add just a little bit more, maybe to be a little clearer about that. Uh, first, to say that if I use the children's book occasionally as an anchoring point for our thinking and just or a restful place for your eyes, it's partly to give you a chance to have little inter interludes. I think it's important. It provides that kind of thing. But also, I want to say to you, that uh, next to that book, huh, you have still, look at the back here, my pile of serious books that I have been stud studying and, and reading. And I do bring those books to my interpretation of cozy, what is it called? Cozy classics, uh, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. But you know, there's, uh, there are different other texts that are available. And for example, there, there, there is that one. Maybe I should have started there. I should have started by giving you the major influences of, uh, on Jane Austen. Um, well, I will give you some more figures because I actually, you'll probably have noticed that there's a blatant absence here for those of you who have studied Austin, had read her, have read her. There's a blatant absence here, um, among other things, of Byron, but also, of course, of women. Hmm? And I want to say, of course, that as I have worked, as I've built my library, you can't see all the books because we can't go to our library. So some of them are actually on my uh, Kindle or some of them are just in my memory. But there are a list of scholars whose names will come back and whose names will be on some of the slides and who you will get the materials separately as we send it out together with um, Vicky. But there are people like already mentioned, George Steiner, um, Tony Tanner, the big name I flaunted at the beginning of my description of the course, the philosopher Habermas, but also Nicola Bradbury, wonderful scholar, a woman, Claire Tomalin, an amazing biographer, and also my very good friend with whom I studied reading and cultures of reading in depth, and who is an amazing specialist of Deirdre Lynn, of, of uh, Austin, and <laughs> the confusion is revealing, Deirdre Lynch, who at Harvard has been for a number of years now lecturing with tremendous success. She's a celebrity there, Deirdre, on Jane Austen. She has helped me see things that the, the specialist only can point out for you. But still, I have to tackle this question of what it means now hmm, to be reading Jane Austen. What it means now, especially to be reading Emma and Persuasion. And uh, to read Emma and Persuasion, forgive me, is to, uh, for one thing, I think, uh, be prepared for uh, the fact that these are two books that were written late in uh, Austin's career. One of them was written extremely quickly. That's Emma. When you think that it was all done in handwriting and that there were many interruptions, it, uh, it took uh, a little more than a year 
for her to have a final draft, a clean draft of the book. So Emma written fast, persuasion written with great care. In fact, in 1814, as Tony Tanner mentions, 1814, which is a very important date in terms of uh, the history of uh, uh, French and English uh, relations. And um, the other reason, I think, for looking at Emma and persuasion as being particularly interesting text has to do with the fact that whereas these books, in fact, have many of the features that are related to uh, Pride and Prejudice. Uh, they have, especially with Emma, I think, the kind of spontaneity and the highly relatable figures such as Emma and Harriet that you find in other novels. Whereas that is the case, at that point, this is such a uh, an important theme that it's been completely reworked and made far more subtle, far more complex, and far morally complex when it is treated in Emma. In Emma, it's a question, it's a debate, it's about ideas, whereas in uh, Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice, it is more about giving us a story that involves you in Austin's world. And the, um, th what's distinctive about persuasion is, as I said, the care that was taken for it. And in fact, it's a book that amazingly has two different endings. And these two different endings are the sign of uh, not only the intelligence, but also the kind of commitment that uh, Austin made to actually profoundly uh, rethink how she was going to do the romance. But in both novels, I want to support the claim, I want to support the claim that in both novels, you are going to find the kinds of rewards that one gets from reading Austin in, um, in a way that approaches her work in terms of a moral topography. Moral topography is a word, by the way, that I want to acknowledge as being the word used by Nicola Bradbury. Now, I'll go a little faster here because I have to, but I wish I didn't. But uh, here are, in a parallel slide, a moment that is worth pondering over at least uh, for a minute or two, which is this one. Here is a woman writer who has a reputation for being a romantic, for doing work that is actually refined, uh, exquisite, uh, that renders things and characters and the sentiment with great artistry, but who, frankly, hmm, frankly, doesn't do the big stuff very well, who, in fact, does everything in that minute and restricted way. What I have paraphrased for you here, and you'll get that in the full PowerPoint, is a slide uh, for which um, I wrote the text down, which is a slide that reminds us how distinctive and how difficult it was for Jane Austen to actually make a name for herself because uh, there was a sense, and it's typical for all or most of the women writers that I have studied, especially the famous Georges Sand, there is a sense in which for the readers of Austin, the books she has produced are in fact not punchy enough, so to speak, to produce the effect that will bring you to that place where you say, wow, that's a fantastic book after all. The focus, by the way, of uh, Walter Scott's reflection when he produces finally reluctantly a review of um, Emma is on the scene <laughs> on the moment of um, well what are we, what does he call it the big bow wow 
the, or rather the big bow wall, that is the marriage vow and the bow, bowing to someone that actually marks huh, the final moment of the novel, the moment of happiness, the moment of marriage, that is such a strong future. But to get to that place where we can actually talk about the denouement, we can talk about the ending, we have quite a bit of work to do. And one of the things that uh, I think will help us is to actually move into a completely different domain, which will serve me, among other things, to demote from its uh, entrenched position the idea that when we read Austin, we might be reading a Victorian. We're not reading a Victorian when we're reading Austin. We are reading someone who, for example, said about the criticism on her novel that was collected by herself as she decided to keep a record of the reception of her work. It, when people commented on um, Austin's work, we know that from these documents that she has kept herself, they said strings that seem rather unexpected to us. For example, one wrote, a society lady wrote, that she did not like the novel and says Austin, that she objected to my exposing the sex in the character of the heroine. Exposing the sex in the character of the heroine, I, I was surprised. I didn't actually think, given all the studies I had done about the Victorianism of that 19th century moment and about questions of vocabularies that would have been allowed in her world, I did not expect that my writer, Jane Austen, would actually, the way in which I imagined her, would actually use the word sex. But she did. She did. And um, as part of trying to figure out how I could talk about that element of eroticism in Austen, and I should say, I have to talk about that element of eroticism because I had been challenged by my teacher. My teacher had said to me, there is, he wrote it, he didn't tell me, he wrote it in his book, but he said, uh, there is no erotic imagination, so to speak, in Jane Austen's world. In words or world is the question. In her world, you are hard put actually to find places where that erotic imagination is thriving, the one of the kind that we saw with the French lady translator. However, if you think about the book in terms of its themes and some of the images it produces, one of the places I would like to take you to in a quick you know, zooming in moment is the places where the dances are present in the novel. You could reread or you could read the upcoming novels in terms, and Emma would be the centerpiece, in terms of what they tell us about the dance. Now, what do we need to know about the dance? We need to know two or three things. That for Austin, this is the place where you get movement. This is the place where the body can, in spite of what it wears, so to speak, in spite of the constraints of the body that is there in its dresses and in its flounces and in with its uh, curled hair or non-curled hair, it's the body that enjoys freedom and happiness. And actually, her biography, just as much as her novels, show that for her, dancing was a very important activity that she really loved, relished her opportunities for dancing. Now, dancing at the same time, one has to say, is a practice, is an activity that stages bodies for an audience and that in fact is highly choreographed. In a way, what I'm trying to say is that in her books, Austin choreographs bodies by inventing dances for them. And that as she does that, huh, she, act, she produces images of body in motion that have an uncanny presence for us because once they move, they're actually 
not two dimensional anymore. They're actually three dimensional. And not only that, once they move, as we know, huh, they, they can actually open up like a breaking something that would be in the ordinary script of stilted decorum and manners. Those moments of dancing can actually create moments of eroticism and desire that are, so to speak, choreographed into the fiction. And I know that because, among other things, I have studied at my leisure, actually, no, in my teaching, in my work, um, books like The Sorrows of Leon Werther by Goethe, maybe familiar to some of you, a romantic blockbuster that depends on a waltz for seduction, or a book such as Madame Bovary, the famous classic by Flaubert, where wine desire and visions of happiness begin uh, when the heroine can, is invited to waltzing in a nobleman's house. But what's different about Austin is actually that she's not ironic about these scenes, that in fact, she seems to want to say that in her world and in her imagination, when it comes to imagining the freedom, the ability to actually enter into a world that is that of woman's mobility, that is that of her taking on her freedom, well, the best thing to do is in fact to go to this place. It's to imagine that you can run, that you can actually be in the butt, so to speak, that you can hmm, have that rosy complexion that comes from running a little too fast from one place to another. And if you have not read Pride and Prejudice yet, you might want to look at Kiara Knightley, Kiara, I'm mispronouncing her name probably, Kiara Knightley in the film. It's a good shorthand but it's absolutely clear to me that there are scenes of uh, bodily liberation, so to speak, of freedom and of happiness and of grasping the possibility of happiness in a physical way that are just as strong in Austin fiction as they would be in a film. And I, you know, just to, as a kind of mnemonics, I just want to show you how that's, that's the book where this is coming from, and that's the book where you might want to go. Here is my shorthand in a way. My shorthand is to say there's one way, of course, in which Jane Austen liberates herself from the constraints of her world. And uh, when I say constraints of her world, I actually think this is as good a slide as I can give you. And I think uh, the title for the slide, which by the way was given to me by Clara, um, as we are all in confinement and as we were zooming last night to finish, Clara is my assistant, to finish my um, PowerPoint, men hunt and women stay at home. Well, there you are, men hunt and women stay at home. We're going to run that theme um, to greater uh, depths, so to speak, in some of our later conversations. But I hope you're amused and interested in the quiet moment on the right side and the way in which the shooting party is, is, is present. Uh, by the way, when you read your novel or reread your novels, just pay attention to that theme. Men love hunting and women, women well, they, they love taking care of others. They, they are into emotional labor in Jane Austen's world. But look at this. Here is where our heroine goes. Uh, that's her place. Huh? That's the desk. That's the place where she can, in fact, persuade others, enrich others' lives, create a world of her own. She can do all kinds of things that uh, are central and crucial to uh, our understanding of the world as known through Austin, of her inner world, of her experiences, of uh, the ways in which she so perceived, documented, registered, uh, memorized things that were part of that experience of hers of sitting in a small cottage 
not being able to show too much that she was actually a lady writer. That vision of Austin is the one that is uh, of great significance to me. And it is a vision, and these are you know, my last concluding remarks here. This is a vision that I will want you to um, explore with me in, in, from many different angles. And I'll just throw out like this, if I can, these three ideas that uh, are central here. And they're ideas that come from the in-depth reading done of Bradbury, of Tanner, of Steiner, of Habermas, all these names I flaunted at the beginning. One idea is that to understand Austin, you have to understand the notion of transparency. You have to actually deep in your commitment to reading her, except that though her words and her images are simple, they're not that many metaphors, though her ability to actually pull up the true romantic scene with sentimentality, the one that is really a tearjerker or a bodice ripper, that she doesn't do that. But what she offers instead is a subtle, persistent, but very powerful imagination, that erotic imagination that arises in the less is more, that arises in the reticence that she uses. And in the debates I have with George Steiner, there is that sentence that I will use next time almost as, a, as, a, as an epigraph again, which is, in Jane Austen, sex is essentially gender says George Steiner. In Jane Austen, sex is essentially the gender. That's something that you might want to meditate on. The second piece of this has to do with imagining how and why, in what context, Jane Austen was able to gain authority. And in order to take you to that place, what I will do is indeed unpack for you some of the things that both Tony Tanner and Habermas have said to us about women's ability to speak up and to take ownership of language in order to actually persuade us, so to speak, of uh, the authority that can be hers, even though she's just a woman, even though she is a member of that strange rising class, which is that of the bourgeois woman. And in that context, by the way, we'll be talking a little bit about Virginia Woolf, which I hope you'll enjoy. Finally, huh? finally, what I want to emphasize is that as I will show you with more time and more patience next time, I will show you that one of the crucial moves that occurs in the work and in the world of Jane Austen, is this ability to capture, to captivate us, to grab us with the idea that it is possible if you write in a certain way to move from a place where you just, um, to move from a place where you just um, talking to a place where you're actually talking to others, where in your writing, you're actually in a position where you can speak for yourself and you can speak for your freedom and your desires by ironically placing in your writing your very voice. In other words, what I want to say is that if there is a red uh, thread that we can follow as a guideline uh, in our reading of Austin, it is to say that what she actually manages to manufacture for us, hence the beauty of her brilliant designs, is a voice that makes us enter into a universe of experiences that is her creation, and yet at the same time speaks to us and lingers with us because we would have read about it and not just seen it as a film.